Okay, Triumph and Glory. Uh, let's see if I can kind of summarize much of what I was thinking about while I was applying it. Now, I've got uh, Borodino up here, which is part of the same system, and we'll see how it changes. I didn't want to touch the Borodino rules. I actually thought I liked these better, but I've got some pretty big grumps on these, so maybe uh, I, guess I, I, I will give a, change, a try to the actual 2.2 uh, version rules. I've been largely using the 2.0, which was the update for this, although in the first couple scenarios I used the original rulebook. I had them all available to me. Uh, just sometimes I don't trust updates as being improvements. So for example, with the Men of Iron series, I kind of liked the original rules better overall. Um, Component-wise, you know, if you're picking up a used game here, it's probably not going to be reprinted. How important is that? Well, the, uh, the paper maps are fairly thin, this era of GMT. Is. It's early, not tremendously, but uh, I don't have a year on it that I can see. 2000, not tremendously early. But uh, yeah, the maps are a little thin. They're gonna, I, I can see that they're gonna wear out from backfolding and stuff like that eventually. The counters you're gonna be dealing with um, mostly per battle counters, but there's one exception. There's a small bag of shared counters between. Aspirin, Esling, and Vagram, and then there's two counters that are used both in Rob and in Vagram. That can be a little annoying when you're trying to clean up. It's kind of nice to be able to sweep everything aside. I bet you they put these out in C3I. There are also some corrections that are needed. Uh, a few misprinted counters. The big one being a color misprint in, in Vagram. Didn't end up hurting me, but I could see it being pretty annoying. You have some charts and tables. Uh, specifically, the terrain charts are kind of hard for me to read. They're just small print, lots and lots of issues. You know, it's not bad to read, say, Rob, but when you get down to the Bagram, uh, Aspirin Essling one, that's pretty bad. And I think the, uh, yeah, we got other ones here. Austerlitz and Castiglione, which are both kind of large as well. So let's look at the rules a little bit. Yeah, let me talk a little about the scenarios. So for me, I enjoyed Austerlitz the most. I kind of like Austerlitz to begin with, but it had sort of the ability to, to move around more fluidly than I think either Aspirin Essling, Vagram, Rob uh, have. Castiglione and Vagram have the problem that you have to disengage in them. Disengaging in this system is, I think, harder than it should be. That could just be the vagaries of the chit pull. But overall, I found that it was difficult to get away from the enemy in a way that I don't feel like it's difficult in many other uh, games, including Napoleonic Era. There are games where I feel like disengagement is too simple or too easy in some ways. For example, in uh, the Musket and Pike series, end of battle disengagement is kind of this automatic oh yeah you, you got out of there and you're all okay and you don't count any casualties <laughs> there's no pursuit uh, if you uh, end up withdrawing from the battle due to having everything in rally condition which I think is absolutely bogus but uh, <laughs> and I try to forget about that and play out the pursuit as I go um, but in this I felt like just tactically moving my troops out was as hard as a 30 years war situation would be. And it wasn't just the cav that could chase me, it was everything can move faster than my withdrawing units because if I'm withdrawing a whole bunch of units, uh, they may not be the ones that are under orders. I may be having trouble getting them into orders and I feel like, look, if guys are trying to get out of there, they're not going to be foot dragging about it for the most part. There may be strange instances, but in general, if you're trying to withdraw, you should be able to do it. And the order system doesn't really allow that. So the order system is actually kind of the uh, key neat thing about this game, is not only do you have a chip pull, 
but you have to have units under orders to fully move them. And, you know, you could throw an exception for withdrawal in there. They have an exception for entering the map, and you go into a, uh, a road column formation can get out of there quick, or can get into the battle more quickly. Uh, but otherwise, basically, if you want to move a unit that you haven't assigned a very limited number of orders to, you have to roll a die, and that's going to be based on the effectiveness of the commanders there. I think there's a big difference between the effectiveness in commanders in uh, effecting an attack <laughs> and effecting a withdrawal when they're in a hopeless position. And just a little tweak that I'd that I that I'd see there, but it definitely spoiled my Vagram experience. And I think it. I think it's key to Castiglione's uh, scenario, victory conditions, so you don't maybe don't want to tweak it for that because that may have been play-tested uh, to match that. But uh, in general, I think you should be able to pull out when you desire to pull out, more or less. Uh, the rules themselves aren't terribly well-written. I don't know how much they improve in Borodino. It didn't look like much, but neither of the versions I have... Uh, really nailed things down as well as they could, uh, but, well, it's a burden game. Um, on top of uh, the activation of commands, your leader, your overall army commanders also have the ability to affect units really close to them. So what ends up happening is the units that are under orders end up being away from the army leader, at least with a good army leader with, like Napoleon. And units that are kind of close to the army commander are the ones that are going to be taking chances on whether or not they can take an ex get an acceptance. I guess that works okay, but sometimes it feels a little uh, wrong. It feels like you have more control over the stuff that's far away from you. Uh, I, I, I prefer something like the NBS system of orders writing. But if you don't want the orders writing, I think something like this could work pretty well. It just needs some, some tinkering. It's not quite there. Uh, combat itself. So early on in the game, I thought artillery was a little underpowered. But what I found is as long as you can mass artillery, you can do quite a bit with it and kind of bust up the opponent's line before you attack and certainly bust it up before he bust his line up before he attacks. So it's actually fairly effective. What I found kind of silly, and maybe I'm misplaying it, but I keep looking and I don't see anything. Uh, I should be looking in the more modern rules. But I don't see anything that handles it, which is that um, Cav is more effective when it's not charging. <laughs> it can uh, it can attack. Maybe this is the same kind of thing as with the artillery that I'm just missing something in concept. But it can attack perfectly fine. Um, oh no! Yeah, I screwed it up completely. Okay. <laughs> no big shock there. Okay, so, yeah. So my playthroughs were completely screwed up. So Cav can only shock if they begin next to a unit or if they charge. Now, did that change between the rules? Because that would make a big difference to me. I, I bet you it didn't. Yeah, I'm not seeing... That looks like that was a change that I missed when I switched to the newer rules. Um... So, okay, if you're playing with the old, the original rules, the version 1, uh, Cav is just goofy. It doesn't charge at all, but it's able to whip around and do what it wants. The 2.0 rules make Cav a, a much more um, fragile device because they can only attack what they're adjacent to or position themselves for a charge. So they're not going to really be too flexible in being able... Uh, to run around an enemy and attack them. What they have to do is be sitting within three hexes uh, at the beginning of their action in order to engage. Um, that may be a little too restrictive. I didn't get to play any of that because my cav was just fine just running around people and, and doing all kind of outflanking, but it was awfully potent doing that. And the idea of charging for an extra plus two advantage in combat seemed goofy as hell to me. Uh, once you charge, you have counter-charge opportunities and all that. And that, that works well. So, uh, one thing that I had a difficulty with was the Jaegers. 
which have some special rules with them, but they're kind of hard to discern on the map. That's more of a, a counter issue, uh, a component issue, than the rules themselves. But I found myself just treating them largely like normal infantry and never really using their special abilities. Uh, some interesting interplays between the zones of control and the... Uh, and the movement rules. So uh, you're able, you're not able to move adjacent to units unless you're in command and you must stop immediately when you move adjacent to a unit. And you can't move, I think from adjacent, but it may be from zone of control to an enemy zone of control directly. And if you leave an enemy zone of control, you can't move into another zone of control in that move. Just, there's sort of this, it never really gelled in my mind where the zone of control, uh, frontal zone of control. So here's the thing, you have zone of controls, which are adjacency, and then you have frontal zone of controls. And the way they were kind of handled, it never really fixed in my mind, and I probably played it wrong in a lot of cases. Um, overall though, I like the scale of this game if you want to go a little lighter than something like uh, NBS. Now, it's at about the same scale as the NBS is, but it feels much, much, much higher level. Uh, NBS always feels like a regimental game, just like CWB does. Whereas this, uh, this feels like a layer above that, closer in a lot of ways to something like um, if you if you ever played um, so the old Napoleon at Waterloo system got expanded uh, and there were some rules that someone came up with in a moves for actually Napoleon's art of war to make it a little more complicated make the cav a little bit more uh, flexible make the units a little more fluid the fluidity though comes at a cost you see units uh, whole, whole core kind of crab walking their way across the map in front of the enemy so that they never expose themselves you don't see sort of that frontal impetus to movement unless the player wants it. Now that's a problem that's in a lot of the tactical games and it kind of comes with the territory. Um, the impressive thing to me was that the line of battle, uh, uh, I guess it's an extension still to CWB, I don't know, it not, really isn't, it's its own series now. Uh, the old RSS for American Civil War by the gamers was an extension to CWB. Line of Battle is kind of the replacement for that, and it kind of meshes the two together um, in, a, in a more cohesive fashion. They've gotten rid of that crab walk, and I kind of like that it's gone. And how did they get rid of it? They got rid of it with locking zones of control, which was kind of funny, you know? Go back to the ancient, ancient rules, you know, from the early days of, of, of our hobby. Well, this kind of does the same sort of thing, but uh, I still see too much crab walking going on. It, it feels too easy to skitter right in front of your uh, enemy. You, maybe it's just that you have more um, incentive to do so in this than you would in the line of battle, because, I don't know, the scale and everything feels about the same. Anyway, this gives you an interesting look. I don't think it's a terribly historically accurate one. It certainly isn't a terribly detailed one. Um, obviously, I played some rules wrong, and hopefully when I get around to Borodino, uh, we'll get to see how the calf's supposed to actually work. And those are the updated rules, the fully updated ones. The rules that come with the game are problematic. And that's largely what I, I, I played with, kind of, I guess, a bastardization between them, uh, some shit I made up on my own, probably, <laughs> as usual, and then the version 2.0 rules, which were the upgrade for this. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Bordino you know, improves on it, and maybe someday I'll get back to this with the most updated rules. I want to do that with NBS, too. Um, this is kind of expensive to find, I, I've noticed, so... Unless you have, uh, you know, a Berg fetish, like maybe I do, I'm not sure that this is terribly worth picking up. If they cleaned it up, wow, that's tough. If they cleaned it up, 
Um, you know, maybe it would be a little better, but to tell you the truth, I was kind of surprised Borodino got uh, re got printed after this because this didn't really sell too well. Uh, and I don't think Borodino sold too well. I mean, I guess Bird can like float a couple of games that are not well received uh, by the populace. Uh, but I don't think GMT is going to put out a re-release of this uh, with Borodino having sat in the uh, garbage bin, uh, bargain bin for a while. Uh, I'll be doing something non-Napoleonic next, although somewhat uh, informed by a Napoleonic game. It's got some Sort of, I, I like to consider it uh, Empires in Arms light in the 20th century. We'll see that soon.